As long as I've been able to walk, honestly, I always wanted to go into the dance studio with my sister. My mom would take me along. I would throw a fit because I wanted to go in and dance. So she knew right then and there that as soon as I was old enough and able to, she needed to sign me up for dance. I was six years old when I started competitive dance. It's just such a tough world to live in that you're constantly being compared to one another. You're constantly trying to get a better position than others. Dirty looks from the competition. Girls are out to get each other. <laughs> I was about ready to quit dance at Augie. It just gets very cutthroat. I found out anthropology and archaeology is hands-on history. We had a hands-on class for two weeks of how to flint nap, hitting rocks together to make arrowheads. So I really loved that. So when we got there, they gave me the wrong information for my host family. I had the right address, didn't have the right door code. It was raining when I got there, didn't have a shuttle to pick me up. I got scammed by a fake taxi driver. I was so panicked. I was on the phone crying to my dad. It was very stressful. I was so worried on grades in college, which looking back on it, I wish I wasn't. It is the experience you gain from the class and the cool things you learn about the world and anything in the subject that you really take from it. Welcome as we continue our journey back to college. I'm your host, Zach Stevenson, and this is season two where we are traveling. We are physically traveling overseas to the US to not only catch up, but to dive into deep conversation with my friends who came to America from countries all over the world. This season by far is bigger and better with international students from even more countries, American students, student athletes, some of my basketball teammates, and even staff and professors. I'm so excited to share with you the truly, truly incredible people I met during the best four years of my life as we record 27 in-person episodes on campus, but also in other parts across the US. We hear the stories from this unique once in a lifetime experience that ultimately transformed us into the people we set out to become. Make sure to subscribe, whether it's on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening, because there's so many awesome episodes on the way. Today, we're joined by someone who was destined to dance before she could even put two steps together. She grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and was on the dance team while at Augie. She graduated from Augustana with a double major in anthropology and French and is currently pursuing a career in dance down in Kansas with the Kansas City Chiefs, who are the one, one of the biggest teams in the NFL, and they actually just won the Super Bowl. I couldn't be more excited to kick off season two of Back to College with JC. JC Holsing, welcome back to college. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for hosting me in your apartment. We're in Kansas City. In Kansas? Mm -hmm. Well, Overland Park. Kansas. Overland Park. <laughs> okay, to be specific. But to me, I don't know, Kansas City, that's sort of what it encompasses. Um, I've just been, I mean, this is the first actual recording we're, we're doing in the US. I arrived, what day is it today? Sunday. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's it is Sunday, Sunday already. <laughs> I arrived on Tuesday. I've stayed at my friend Naoki's place over in Manhattan, which is a two hour drive away. Um, for the last few days and Rebecca's wedding was last night, which was sort of the main spark to get me over here. And now we're just on the podcast way and we're podcasting. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure if I was going to have too many American guests on the podcast, but I think like while I'm here, I mean, all of, yeah, I say all of you, all of y'all, <laughs> the Americans, I think, well, I mean, they just added up to, um, you guys made the, the college experience what it is, and it wouldn't be college in the US without all the American students. So I think it's it's great to sit down and have a chat. You were on the dance team during all year. That's sort of what you've been doing. And now you're at a workshop yesterday. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that and how that went? Yeah. So I went to a workshop yesterday for the Kansas City Chiefs cheerleaders. Um I can thank Augustana for actually getting me to the point where I wanted to be 
doing professional dance in this aspect because I always thought that I wouldn't uh, just because the pro dance world can seem so toxic at times. Girls can be catty, fighting for spots, and then seems like teammates just don't get along. Um, but with the Kansas City Chiefs, that's not it at all. And that's what drew me to them after hearing the coach speak at a convention that I went to as an Augie dancer. So from there, I just, we all were dancing together. We started off, um, we would do across the floor work, um, leaps, turns, kicks, lots of technique stuff. All the technical stuff. Yeah, all the technical stuff just to see and what we're doing and everyone getting comfortable and chatting with each other. Um, they really want the environment to be very welcoming, which is nice. Um, and then from there, we learned four different routines, which usually we only do about two. So this was a very long, it was like a six hour long workshop, but it was a lot of fun. Got to meet a lot of new people, um, experience more of what the audition process is like, uh, and just kind of see what we're all getting into. Yeah, that's huge. And And so I came into town yesterday, so I kind of, admittedly just sort of dropped my stuff off I saw you for a brief <laughs> period but you all you had to go go on to the workshop and you're sort of in the preparation for is it March of next year that they do the the intake for sort of like the tryouts for is it the do you call it the cheer squad or the dance team for the Chiefs so usually in the NFL and NBA world, their pro dancers are called cheerleaders. Yeah. So some teams like the Tennessee Titans focus more on the stunting aspect of it, which is more of cheer, like throwing girls in the air and everything. But a lot of them also focus on dancing. So the Chiefs cheer squad is primarily all dancers. The most cheer that they do is just like cheering on the sidelines and then some girls can tumble, but otherwise they are primarily just a dance team. Yeah, good. Cause I wanted to clarify that. I wasn't really too sure of the difference. Cause I know at Augie there was a dance team and a cheer squad as well. So I, even now I'm not too sure what the difference was, but you're on the dance team at Augustana. Yes. So the cheer girls focused on the stunting aspects, putting girls up in the air, um, doing lots more of the vocal cheers on the sidelines. Whereas the dance team, we didn't usually lift anyone in the air, maybe once or twice in a routine when we would perform at halftime. But otherwise we just did mostly sideline dances. We did some cheering, like vocalizing on the sidelines, but otherwise it was all dance. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you're, and you're building up to the tryouts next year early next year. Yes. So we don't have dates set yet, but usually they happen around March and into April a little bit. I should mention for those who aren't you Americans, the Kansas City Chiefs, one of the biggest NFL teams, um, so American football. And yeah, you've, that's sort of where, where you're, the trajectory on which you're going at the moment is sort of, that's your main focus. You've always been into dance. And I want to, if you could take us back to when that sort of started for you. Yeah. So as long as I've been able to walk, honestly, I always wanted to go into the dance studio with my sister. My sister was in, I think, ballet and tap classes when she was younger. So she's five years older than me. Um, my mom would take me along to the dance studio to drop off my sister and apparently, uh, as she has told me many times before, <laughs> she had to start leaving me at home or leaving me with my dad when she would drop my sister off because I would throw a fit because I wanted to go in and dance with my sister. So she knew right then and there that as soon as I was old enough and able to, she needed to sign me up for dance. <laughs> so like pretty much as soon as you could walk, you were dancing. Pretty much. Yeah. I think I was about a year old when that was going on. Um, and then I started when I was, I had just turned three, I think. Right. And you grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is mm -hmm. where Augustana is. That's where we went to school. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in good old Sioux Falls in South Dakota? Well, the winters were very cold. <laughs> they still are? Can yes, confirm? they are. Um, it was pretty fun. I mean, it's very different, especially after moving down here to Kansas. I had never lived anywhere outside of the house that my parents still live in. So moving onto campus at Augustana was a little bit different, 
but I still didn't really feel like I had moved a whole lot because I was still stationed right in the same city where I grew up. Um, I guess I don't really know how to explain how it was growing up. I kept myself very busy between school and dance and I was always involved in a lot of things. Like in high school, I did theater as well as dance and orchestra. So I just always had a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. And so what was the the dancing like? You would just go to, to classes, I'm assuming. And that's just sort of how you like, learned the craft and how you pro- progressed and performed um, throughout your younger years. Yeah. So I grew up mostly doing ballet. I did some tap, but I didn't really like it as much. And then I did jazz classes as well. And then once I was old enough, I think I was six years old when I started competitive dance. So for those first few years, I just took like one or two classes a week. Um, And then once it came to competitive, then I would have a few more days a week that I was at the studio doing not only my basic ballet, tap, jazz classes, but also having classes just for our competitive teams. And on those competitive teams, we would travel around, usually staying within South Dakota, but we would also travel to Iowa, uh, Minnesota, sometimes to Nebraska. We would occasionally go over to Wisconsin if we were feeling crazy. Um, (laughs) But yeah, we would travel around, go to competitions, and then bring back whatever feedback we had, work towards the next competition, and then keep going with that (laughs) and so what was that competitive dancing like was it was it pretty competitive or was it still reasonably chill at those younger ages it is definitely very competitive when you're doing studio like competitions um like between like k-12 k-12 through um Girls are out to get each other. (laughs) Different studios have major rivalries, just like regular sports teams do. It's very strange to think, um, which is why it's been so refreshing going through with the Kansas City Chiefs cheer program because they try to get rid of all the competitive aspect of being a dancer. Um, But yeah, there were definitely teams and studios that did not like each other. And we would always try to see who could get that first place or place higher, Um, especially staying mostly in South Dakota for competitions. You were competing against the same studios over and over and over. So there wasn't a lot of different people, different dancers coming in. Um, It's very much the same competition all the way through. Yeah. It seems very cutthroat. And I think it's it's interesting that um that now that you've sort of basically made it to like I would say the pinnacle of like your dance career and where it would seemingly be the most serious at the the most elite level, it's um the the you said that the chief sort of encourage and foster that sort of like that not not so competitive but like, mm-hmm. hey, we're all in this together, like we're trying to build each other up and like be able to perform the best we possibly can, like as a unit, as opposed to trying to tear each other down, which I find quite fascinating. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely teams out there where they thrive off the competition um, and the competitive aspect of their audition process. I've seen videos online of (laughs) specifically, there was an NBA team, um, a bunch of the veteran candidates at auditions all wore the same outfit And the person that posted it said, we decided to dress all the same today to intimidate the competition, the new rookies coming in. And I was just completely baffled by that because the chiefs are not about that. We all cheer each other on and you make friends. They want the environment to be as welcoming as possible. And even through to the final round of auditions, you're there to support one another and to make lifelong friendships and go through the process together because you're all looking forward to this one dream that you have. And the coach really likes to mention this quote from their coach, Andy Reid, um, well, the Chiefs coach, Andy Reid, that he says the main mantra of the Kansas City Chiefs at this point is enter as a team, leave as family. So the entire organization takes that on, even down to the cheerleaders, down to all of the staff, everyone. Um, They really want to foster that family environment. Which I love. I think that's very powerful. And it can be, I think it is a stronger motivator than trying to 
push everyone away and put their backs to the wall where they have to start clawing at each other to do whatever they can to get to the top. But you you would say that that was sort of what it was like growing up, kind of like that that NBA example that you gave where the, the veterans come in with their T-shirt saying, <laughs> hey, we're here, this is our show. Like, rookies, you better bring it. Yeah, there were definitely, you'd get dirty looks from the competition walking down the hallways uh, at the venue, wherever you're at. So that's exactly it's, what, from what I see in the movies, that's yeah. exactly how I envision it. Oh, it is exactly like that. It's uncanny. It's crazy that that is what you live in the dance world. So trying to get out of that mindset is so hard. And that's why so many dancers decide to quit after they're done with high school or after they're done with college, because it's just such a tough world to live in that you're constantly being compared to one another. You're constantly trying to get a better position than others. Um, it just gets very cutthroat and causes people to just not be happy with what they're doing when the whole point of dancing is to have fun and enjoy something that you love doing. So why didn't you quit then? Because you don't strike me as one of those persons who's going to be like, I don't know, a mean bitch for the lack of a better term to, <laughs> to claw at someone else. Um, you're very kind and caring um, from like just the time that was spent together. That It's pretty apparent to me that that's how you act and that's how you like to like put yourself out into the world. So how come you decide to keep pursuing dancing when it is in that sort of to toxic sort of culture? Yeah, well, I knew the coach, the dance coach at Augie before I decided on where I was going. Uh, and she sort of brought me in and said, hey, we're all just a family. It's not a competitive audition process. Um, almost everyone that auditions will make it on uh, unless we have to cut back numbers for some reason. And she said, we all just like working hard and dancing together and having fun. So that's why after high school, I was like, well, sure, I can keep dancing into college. That'll be fine. It's less of a commitment not being at the studio like five days a week. We had two practices a week and then game day. Um, but then post-college, I had decided, nope, I'm going to be done. Don't want to do this anymore. Professional dance is just crazy, and I don't think I would fit in there. But then the summer of 2021, I went to Pro Action Dance Convention in Las Vegas with Augie to learn choreography for our year and said coach told me, hey, there's a coach's panel and they are speaking on their pro teams. You need to go to it. And I was like, why is no one else going to this? And she said, you just need to go to it. And I was like, I'm not doing pro dance. I don't want to. It's not the type of world I want to be in. And she basically forced me to go to this panel and listen to what these coaches had to say. And the Chiefs cheer coach was actually there and spoke on behalf of her team. And I was already impressed with their dancers because they are really good. They're really sweet people. Um, and there's one girl in specific, uh, Tiffany, that was in a bunch of the classes that I took at the convention that I just ended up looking up to her. Well, then once Coach Judah was speaking about her team saying, we don't let anyone be catty. We don't let anyone be competitive. If you are not a nice, genuine human being, you don't have a place on our team because we are a family and everyone has to love everyone in order for us to achieve our goal together. And from there, she hooked me and I was like, oh shoot, <laughs> this is why Coach Jenna wanted me to go to this because I think she wanted me to see that not all pro dance is the same and that there is or there are some teams that don't harbor that cattiness and yeah that's fantastic it's very interesting because i think i had a very different perspective and way that i went uh, that i approached sort of my basketball i was very serious about it and i think in many ways i did I, I loved all the teammates I played with, but at the same time, I was very much aware, well, hey, like they've got my position. I need to be better than them to take their position. So I sort of had that mindset to to work really hard and, and just be better than them. But it's almost like you have just effortlessly, not without the hard work, but you have just sort of kept on pursuing dance and just because you've just found yourself in great situations and great environments with amazing people surrounding you mm -hmm. to allow you to keep doing that. Yeah, I was about ready to quit 
dance at Augie part of the way through my senior year because we did get some of that cattiness and negative attitudes going on. Um, but I am very glad that I stuck it out and decided to keep pursuing it because dance has always been a part of my life. And even towards the end of just football season, which is just in the fall, um, in school, I was like, man, I don't know if I can be done because I've done it my whole life. So it was just something that I decided, well, I guess if I want to keep doing what I love, I need to keep doing it. And in order to do that, I decided to go for the professional route, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Just small little stepping stones that kept mm -hmm. building up over time. Yeah. And so would you say it was your coach then that sort of got brought you to Augie, that that's where you decided to go? Yeah, it really was. I didn't really know how to pick a college. Um, I didn't really have a guidance counselor in high school that was there to help. I went to the biggest high school in Sioux Falls. Which one's that one? Roosevelt High School. Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was huge. We were like a thousand kids over capacity <laughs> my oh, senior year. My God. It was literally a fire hazard. <laughs> but what just kids sitting on the floor <laughs> while there's others at desk? Pretty much. We are like median class size. Is that the right word? Median? Middle class average. There we go. Yeah. Um, that class size, it was about 30 students. It was huge. Um we had to rearrange classrooms and use rooms that were not really classrooms for classrooms in order to get everyone in and have all the classes for everyone that they could graduate. Um, so you're a thousand over capacity. How big is the school normally then? Normally, I want to say it was about 1,500 students, but my senior year, I think we had about 2,500. My God, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's almost double the size of the school. Yeah. I don't know how you can just magically find room for that. I don't know how we did it, but we did. <laughs> Even the gymnasium had to act as a classroom at times. Uh, it was really crazy. Whenever we had pep rallies, like we had to split it in two groups, like the freshmen and sophomores and the juniors and seniors, because it was a fire hazard to have everyone in there. No, if there was a fire, nobody would get out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the so the dance scene at high school, what sort of things were you doing? Because I know, like, I don't know, just the sport culture as a whole in the US is so much different to Australia and other countries, I'm presuming. But there's lots of, like, the basketball team's playing. So, like, did you guys go and do some dancing at there? And then the football team, did you just go to every sport as, like, a support team, as the dance team? Well, I actually didn't dance for my high school. I know ah, a lot of people did. I stuck to studio only. Um, I was going to do the team in high school, but then I just decided after a couple of practices, the cattiness came out to play. Even girls that I knew that went to my studio weren't talking to me at our high school practices. I went, I think I was at two of them. And since even the girls I knew weren't, talking to me, weren't trying to help me like integrate into the team. I decided that it just wasn't going to be for me because I felt very left out. Um, but yeah, I, a lot of the time high school teams are mostly just competitive. So they go to different competitions. It's all the same high schools competing against each other all year long. <laughs> um, but then there are, there is like a sideline cheer group similar to like what the chiefs or nba nfl teams do uh but that was mostly just like cheer and that was its own thing separate from the competitive dance and competitive cheer teams um i do know that the dance teams would sometimes go and perform like an exhibition at a basketball game but they wouldn't always perform at football games it was only on occasion because usually the marching band would perform at halftime um, but yeah, they mostly kept it to just comp, uh, competition. And then I think in the spring they had a like exhibition team that they would do some performances, but it was very little that they did. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I would have just assumed, oh, well, like you're dancing, like not full time now, but like you, you're taking it as a, as a career option. And that you didn't even like do that in high school. You're just doing the, the studio stuff um, mm -hmm. on the side, which is, or well, not on the side, because I'm sure you were doing that. <laughs> you mentioned five days a week or yeah. so. So yeah, full on as itself. 
Um, but I just thought that was just part of the ecosystem. So that's interesting to know. Yeah. A lot of girls did both studio and high school team, but that just got to be so much. I mean, I didn't even experience it myself, but you'd go to school, you'd get there at what, 7.30, 7.45 for your full day, get out at three o'clock. Sometimes you would have after school rehearsals for practice. Uh, some teams would even do before school practices. So you're getting there at 6 a.m., and then you would go straight from either school or practice to the dance studio for three more hours or more of dance um, at the studio. So it's just a lot. And then having the high school competitive team that usually runs from about, I think, September through November ish. Um it's a very quick season, but once you hit November, that's when the studio competition sort of starts and picks up because that season usually runs um, October-ish, November through April or May. So once they started blending together, it just got to be a lot for a lot of girls, especially the ones I was on team with, and they would work really, really hard um, for high school, and then they'd come to the studio and work really, really hard for our competitions, and I was just like... Best of luck to you guys. I don't want to partake in that. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of them probably got burnt out from it. They were just doing way too much of it. Oh, yeah. A lot of girls did. They'd be like, man, I don't want to be at studio right now. But I mean, at least at the second studio I went to when I was in high school, I switched studios over my sophomore year of high school. Um, those girls at the second studio I went to, they were very much all in for high school, all in for studio and they would just they would stress themselves out because they wouldn't even have time to do their homework. <laughs> but, Crazy, that's yeah. yeah, so much. So, what is it about dancing that you love so much? I think it's the cathartic release that you get from it. Um, well, you can cathartic release. Yeah, tell me more about that. You can release any and all emotions that you want through movement. So if you're feeling particularly down and you enjoy doing more of a contemporary lyrical style of dance, you can turn on music and release whatever you want and attach what you're feeling to the song and to your movement. Um, you can, if you're angry, you can do a really hard hitting hip hop routine. You know, it's just, you can release so much of what you're feeling and just put that into what you're doing as a dancer. And I have no words to even explain the feeling. It is So it's been amazing. a really helpful tool for you then just to be able to cope with whatever you're going through at the time. Whether you're angry, you can just let that out. Or if you're, I don't know, still feeling good and calm, you can do some other sort of routine. Yeah, exactly. I know in college especially, it was very helpful just because – even movement in general, like if you're feeling down, you can go for a run and you'll get a release of, is it serotonin or dopamine? One Dolphins, of the two, you get yeah. all of that releasing. So it kind of tricks your brain. Um, so you're feeling better. So it's that movement plus being able to connect your experiences with your dance that I think helps release and helps almost kind of like a coping mechanism, I guess, um, to deal with whatever is going on in your life. And so you think if, if, when you're dancing, like you do you really feel like your emotions are sort of controlling you and sort of like being let out and expressed through that? Yeah, it definitely depends on the routine. If it's more of a sanction, like performance of whatever we were doing in college for our football game or whatever, it's a little bit less of that. But if you go to workshops, especially or master classes too, where they'll maybe do more of the contemporary or lyrical style, that's where I find I can release like anything and everything because the music, it can be slower, really flowy. I don't know how to describe it, I guess, but it can either be happy. You can make it sad. You can make it angry, um, whatever you want. And you can just flow how you want to with the music. You can find whether it's the vocals that speak to you and dance to those. You can find the piano or the drum or the bass line and just shape your movement around that. Um, and then filter how you're feeling through those movements. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. I'm sure that would be uh, well, yeah, super fun and a great way to express yourself and also manage your emotions as well. It almost seems like a, a mindfulness sort of practice, I think. Yeah, especially if you tune in to 
the music. Some people think of improvising as just figuring out what you're going to do as moves or how do I get to this next trick that I want to throw in there and look impressive. Um, but really what you need to do is listen to the song and pick up on the rhythm of it and go through that. Terrific. And so if we look at your time coming to Augustana, what was that like for you settling in to college, even though it was just maybe a few blocks down the road from where you lived, it was still like we all had to live on campus. So how was that transition for you? It was a little bit different. Um, like I said, I kept myself really busy through high school, uh, but I still felt like I was kind of contained, if that makes any sense. But then when you get to college, everyone is free to do pretty much whatever they want because you're not living at home with your parents. Oh, well, some students do, but for the most part, you're off on your own for the first time. Um, but I did end up using that dance team to foster like most of my relationships, especially freshman year. Those are the people I really clung to um, and was able to build off of that and build a family that I'm still friends with today. Yeah, terrific. And the, the like the dancing at Augie, how was that? Because you said maybe it was a even a little bit of a step down in intensity than it was all the studio work you were doing at high school. Yeah, it was a step down, but it was still a lot of fun. I mean, we still worked really hard as a team because especially my freshman and sophomore years, we were all very, well, throughout the whole time, but COVID kind of messed a little bit with that uh, for junior and senior year. But we all worked really hard. We wanted to look good on the field. We wanted to perform the best we could um, and show up and get more people into our program. So although it was less dancing a week, we were still working really hard to try to build up the program and do the best we could. It was definitely different though. I had never done sideline before. And I was a little nervous that I wouldn't like it because I would go to football games, not really know what's going on. I'd cheer when other people around me were cheering and otherwise hardly pay attention and just hang out with my friends. But I found that once I was on the sidelines, especially for football, that was my favorite experience of college was getting to be directly in on game day instead of just being an observer, a fan, whatever, getting to fully experience that and being on the field with the players and being the main, not main source of excitement, but a good yeah. source of excitement for students and parents. Yeah, the ones that spark everyone on. Yeah. Cause yeah, you guys are always down the front, like waving <laughs> us like, come on guys, let's get into yeah. it. Which is, I mean, it's a hard job because especially if the game isn't going well, mm -hmm. if we're losing, you know, the crowd can be pretty flat. So trying to like motivate them and get them going is a, is a pretty difficult job. And you put like, you're putting yourself out there because it's like, who's this girl like, you know, trying to get us going when we couldn't give a shit because like we're, we're down by so many points and it's just, it's done for like the game's over, but still trying to keep that, the team spirit and that school spirit as well going could be pretty, pretty challenging. It was at times for sure, especially my freshman year of college, we didn't, uh, we won one home game. So we only performed at home games and there was only one single one that we ever won <laughs> at home. Um, so it was tough, but you can't ever, when you're on the sidelines, you can't look disappointed. You have to still just have the excitement and have the enthusiasm to be like, nope, we are doing this. Our team, hey, there's still a chance that we can win. And even if you're down by 50 points, you still have to be ecstatic and super supportive of your team. <laughs> So how do you bring that excitement then? That is a good question. I think we mostly just kind of feed off of each other. Um, like one person will be like, all right, come on, let's go. We got this. And we just try to hype each other up. Or if a good song plays, which Augie Stadium would play pretty good music sometimes, especially for pregame. They had some yeah, bangers in there. I love the vibes there. Like the, the football games are just something different like there's just the atmosphere is so great just being especially sort of that um that fall time of year sort of just mm -hmm. coming off the back of summer nice warm weather super sunny day just like mm -hmm. everyone's in a good mood ready to to get going and 
those the tunes yeah definitely set the tone for that as well yeah even if we were down by 50 points if there was a good song playing we're like hey we can do a really good dance to this and then we would just get going and feed off of our love for just being there and being able to be on the sidelines yeah so you had a great experience then at augustana on the the dance team yeah, it was very good. We hit a little bit of a rocky path um, towards my like the middle of my senior year. Um, there was a turnover in coaching and the dance team didn't have a coach. Uh, the cheer coach ended up having to take on both teams and she mostly focused on the cheer team because that's what she knew how to do. Uh, so we were pretty much self-led for the second half of my senior year. So that was a little bit of a struggle and it brought out kind of the intensity of the girls in the team and a little bit of negativity because it was hard not having a head coach there for us uh, to sort of intervene when tension got high. Yeah, but, to sort of keep everyone in line and everyone yeah. on track. Sort yeah. of that that one, yeah, the one leader that everyone could count on. Yeah, but I think we try, especially as seniors, we tried to work together as a group to really make sure that okay, we might have problems with each other or whatever, but cast that aside, we are on a team. We have to make sure that we look good despite not having a coach. So we are going to make this happen because as a dancer, nobody wants to go out on stage and look back on your performance and be like, what the heck were we doing? So I think we just tried to take charge and say, you know what, we're going to put all this aside we're going to do our job, which is dance and look good while doing it. <laughs> One of the challenges that you also mentioned as we were talking before we started recording mm -hmm. was uh, the the athletic training. So just the the medical treatment that the athletes would get. That was sort of part of being a student athlete at Augustana. There was a room with like trained professionals who were there to look after you as well as, you know, other student helpers but you mentioned that uh, you didn't have the best experience necessarily with them. Yeah, since cheer and dance aren't a sanction, they aren't sanctioned sports under the NCAA, um, we found a lot of issues trying to get in with the trainers because we just weren't a priority. They're sanctioned sports like football, basketball, softball and baseball especially, and probably track because those were some of the main sports at Augie. Um, they would mainly just want to focus on those athletes and make sure that they were performing at their best because those were the teams that were going to bring home championship titles or whatever. So it was really hard to try to get in with the trainers because they just never really wanted to help us since we weren't a sanctioned sport and they weren't required to help us. Um, That's such a hard call because all you guys are at most of the games yeah so it's kind of unfair like we're, we're providing like not only entertainment but like legitimate encouragement and like crowd control mm -hmm. trying to to bring in that atmosphere and the energy into the game so i think you, you play a vital role so it's a bit harsh to be to say for the athletic trainers to say oh well you know we're not, not going to look after you properly yeah that was really tough and especially my senior year i was dealing with a strained hamstring uh, right before my first year of Chiefs Cheer Auditions. And my coach told me, she said, when you go in there, you tell them, Coach Betsy told you to come see them because otherwise they might not talk to you. So she's like, you need to tell them that I said you need to go into them. And I did, and they helped me out. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, they didn't want a whole lot to do with us, even the cheerleaders or whoever all, they just didn't want to, help us out. We came into a lot of struggles, especially with COVID, like fall of 2020 and spring 2021, um, because we weren't a sanctioned sport. So athletics didn't want to put any funding towards COVID testing like they did for the football players to be able to go out on the field together. They said, oh, even though it's going to be outdoors, you're not allowed on the sidelines because you'll be too close to the football players, which we weren't close to them at all. Nah, not um, at all. Not one bit. Yeah. They didn't let us do anything. I mean, we didn't have a football season that year, but even at their um, homecoming scrimmage that they did that year, they didn't let us perform. Um, they barely let us perform at one exhibition game. I think they had in the spring. 
Um, but we had to wear masks while dancing, which is another thing that was a big struggle. All the other sports, they, since they were funding COVID testing for all the athletes, they didn't have to wear masks at practice because it was hazardous to their health, um, running around doing whatever, but cheer and dance still had to so that's wear ridiculous. masks at How practice. How stupid is that? Like, hey guys, we're, like, we're moving too. We're athletes. Yeah. We need to be able to breathe and not throw a mask. Otherwise we're mm-hmm. not going to survive properly. Yeah, I mean, we had to, it would, I remember specifically, like we would, our coach would tell us after we were done doing our routine, she was like, spread out, pull down your mask, get some fresh air. Um, And I just remember while dancing, the fabric going in and out of my nose and mouth, it would like put you on the verge of a panic attack because your body is struggling to breathe already. And then you put a piece of fabric in front of your face and it just was not a good deal. Um... <laughs> I think in hindsight, my opinions of COVID have completely sort of changed. I think like looking back on all the the restrictions that we did, I thought it was kind of stupid. And like probably at the time, sure, it's good because like we weren't actually sure Mm -hmm. what was going on, but it seems a bit ridiculous now looking back like, oh, we can't go next to the football players, even though we're, you know, probably, I don't know, tens of feet away in an like an open stadium, open air. Yeah. Just ridiculous. It was, yeah, it was crazy. And we weren't allowed to be on the sidelines for basketball either. We were allowed to be at the Sanford Pentagon where they would do their games, but we had to be in seats, like in a suite, way up above the um, the basketball court. And we all had to wear masks. The players didn't, um, but we did while we were up there. And we were completely away from anyone that wasn't our team. So it was, it was very strange because we were the only sport that they required all of that of. Um, and it was because we weren't sanctioned under the NCAA. <laughs> so Bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> A little strange, but. Yeah, that's tough. Well, um, yeah, just another little hurdle that you overcame to get you to where you are now. Mm-hmm. So well done for that. At Augie, you studied French and mm-hmm. anthropology. Yes. Did you always go in with the intentions that you're going to come out with those majors? I didn't. So I knew that I wanted to do French uh, for one of my main majors because I took classes in high school and decided I would love to learn a second language and keep working on my proficiency in it, which has now post-college gone way down (laughs) from not using it a lot. But um, I knew that I wanted to do that. I originally actually almost moved to Missouri. I wanted to go to Northwest Missouri State University because my dance coach that brought me to Augie, that was her alma mater. And she said, if you're going anywhere, you should either go to Northwest Missouri or you should go to Augie. Mm. Northwest Missouri, I think, would they have been the ones that beat us in the the regional playoffs because they i think yes. <laughs> for basketball my freshman year we went down there to play mm-hmm. them in their home stadium mm-hmm. and they i think yeah they wiped the floor with us i don't think it was even close in the end but they went on to win the national championship so they've yeah. got a really good well basketball program but obviously other good programs down there too yeah their football team i think has been no don't quote me on this i think it's been a little bit hit or miss some years it's like really good some years it's like eh. but that's kind of how augie was too um but their dance program was pretty good they were national title holders for game day nationals um which was really cool and i wanted to go there i was dead set i was like yeah i'm gonna go to northwest missouri state i'm gonna live in marysville um but then when i was researching their programs they didn't have a full French major program, just a French minor program. So oh, I wow. decided I was like, I'm not going to just take a few classes or just get a minor, even if I take enough credits that I could have a major just because they don't have the major program. Um, so that is what really made me decide on Augie because I had dance team with the coach that I loved and grew up dancing for. And... Um, they had the French program for me. (laughs) Fantastic. And then you actually went to France for a J term for Mm -hmm. what, three and a half weeks? Yeah, just about there. Something like that. (laughs) And how was that experience for you? Oh, it was incredible. It was, it was crazy. We didn't know until about two days before leaving if we were actually going to be able to go. 
because that's when COVID was like cases were spiking up really high all over the world, especially in France. They were having like hundreds of thousands of cases reported daily. Um, so it was very like, are we going? Are we not going? What are the restrictions going to be when we were, get there? So that, that didn't deter you from going. You thought, well, COVID's just everywhere. We're just going to go anyway. Yeah, basically. I was like, this is my last shot to be able to study abroad uh, while I'm in college, which I knew that even paying for the tuition and everything, um, it was a trip for three and a half weeks to France, which I still did classes, but still, nonetheless, a trip for three and a half weeks to France for about, I think tuition was around $6,000, which I was like, you'll never get to do that long of a trip for that low of a cost. With the classes and with your friends as well. Yeah. I only had one friend that went with me, Jenny Felstad. Um, did, we didn't know anyone else because it wasn't an Augie class. It was through a different program um, that now I'm blanking on the name. I think it's AIFS. Hmm. Um, but we went through that program instead of through Augie because Augie didn't have any study abroad programs specifically to France. Um but that's the thing too is Augie does offer like a, did they like did they present to you like hey you can go with this program then um did, so did they sort of help you out with that I actually it was very last minute that I decided to go it was actually after the application period was closed Jenny told me that the application period had just closed and she was going on this trip and I was like oh shoot do you think they'd let me apply if I sent in my application late so I sent in my application just because Jenny said she was going and I was like, well, if I'm not going to be there by myself, if I have at least one person that I'll know, I'll feel a lot more comfortable. So they let me send in my application late and I got placed with a host family and I was allowed to go, which was really, really nice. So I really didn't get any guidance from Augie, but that's just because I was very late to the just game. Just last minute. Let, yeah. Let's just do it. Let's go to France. It was like a an hour decision when Jenny told me that the application had closed like two days prior. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to send in my application now. <laughs> it was so keen to go. Yeah. I just, I wanted to be able to experience that because I knew it would be the perfect time to go over J term because I didn't want to miss out on the dance season since I had already missed out on basically a full year of it due to COVID my junior year. So senior year J term, I was like, this is my last shot and I need to take it. So what were the, so some of the things that you did in France? Because you were doing classes. So was there much structure when you got over there? Um, The program was kind of a mess <laughs> when we got there. They gave me the wrong information for my host family. Oh, really? I had the right address, didn't have the right door code. Uh, it was raining when I got there. They didn't have a shuttle to pick me up. Um, so actually I got scammed by a fake taxi driver for a 200 euro taxi trip from the Charles de Gaulle airport to where my host family was staying. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty expensive. It was very stressful, but I was like, in this situation, if this guy is asking for the money, I was the only one in the car at that point. Jenny had already gotten dropped off. I said I would just pay him and then I'd give her, or she would give me some money later to pay for it. Um, yeah, it was a mess. I was the only one in the car. I was a young woman with a man driving in a foreign country that I was going off of about two hours of sleep on the airplane. <laughs> so I was like, no, no, I'll just give you the money and we're just going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, a little bit jet lagged and, and feeling a little bit of culture shock as well. Oh, in incredibly. Jenny and I both could not remember any French to save our lives when we got there. Mm, it's different once you're, you're in that environment and you don't really have a, a safety net. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. I'm assuming a lot of people would speak English in France, but at the same time you want to practice your skills, but just that blank. Yeah. Um, I studied um, 10 weeks abroad when I was 17 in Germany. Oh yeah. So I understand completely because I didn't think I used much German at all, which was kind of a shame looking back on it, but I was just overwhelmed and just in complete shock. Yeah, it was definitely crazy. Um, I went into full panic mode when I got dropped off and the door code wouldn't work because Jenny and I did have a late flight. So we were supposed to have a shuttle from this program to get everyone from the airport to their homestays. And 
since our flight got in two hours after everyone else, um, they said, are you comfortable taking a taxi? And I said, mm, no. And they said, mm, you're going to have to. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's a little bit strange that you're going to make me do that in a foreign country where, I mean, Jenny and I were the only two that knew any French out of everyone that came over with that group, which is really strange. So I think that's why they said, well, yeah, you can do this. You know some French. Um, but yeah, once I got to my homestay and I finally, I had to call my host mom, but she didn't pick up her phone. She was, I think she was like 74. She was a little old lady and she was such a sweet lady too. Um, but she didn't pick up her phone. So I had to call one of the main people running the program. She didn't pick up her phone at first either. So I panicked and I called my parents and I'm like, I'm standing in the street in Paris. It is pouring rain right now. I have bags just like sitting out around me because I had to bring my suitcase, my backpack, my carry-on bag. And I was like, I can't get into this apartment. And it was getting dark because we got there in the evening. And so I was so panicked. I was on the phone about crying to my dad because I was like, I don't know what to do at this point. Um, and then the lady from the program gave me a call back and she's like, what do you mean you can't get into your homestay? I was like, I'm trying the door code and I can't get in. So she had to call the mom, host mom, and she came out and got me. And she was like, I didn't even know that you were coming. She goes, I thought she I just had not. two. And I was like, no, I got placed with you. <laughs> she was like, oh, okay, that's sure, great. Come on in. And so she brought me in and I, in that panic mode, I remembered all of the French because my host mom didn't know any English. So, so you didn't have a choice at that point. Just I, yeah. The adrenaline kicked in. Well, we're on survival mode now. We got to, where's the French? Let it out. Exactly. So it just started coming out and I was like, I don't even know how I'm doing this right now. And I was just so shocked at that happening. But I was also grateful because at the time she had one of her granddaughters staying with her as well. And her granddaughter spoke very good English. She lives in New York City and works for um, United Nations. Um, so... I was very grateful for that because after I got out of that panic mode where it all came to me, I was back to ground zero, like no French in my brain. I couldn't do anything, couldn't speak at all. So her granddaughter was helping me out a lot. <laughs> so you think that trip to France, was that worthwhile? Did you learn lots? Did you experience the things that you wanted to experience? Oh yeah, it was amazing. I mean, the class I took was the history of Paris through its architecture. So our entire class was walking around in the cold of January in Paris, where it's just very rainy and wet all the time, um, just looking at old buildings. And the professor we had was so nice. Um, she was such a nice lady and she would give us so much information and just seemed to really know everything about all of the buildings that we'd go through, the different cathedrals and churches and mansions and whatever. So it was a great experience. It was literally a walking tour of Paris. Perfect. Couldn't, yeah. have, couldn't have asked for any better by the sounds of it. Exactly. There was another class that was a fashion class that I'm very glad I didn't take because they just sat in a classroom all day, every day. Yeah, well, and I was can, like, I came here. Anywhere in the world. Yeah, I was like, I came here to experience Paris. So it was the most perfect experience and Jenny and I just stuck together the whole time and we really became great friends because of that experience together um and we just would go out and try to sightsee as much as we could on our day off uh, days off and I know we spent an entire day off in the Louvre we spent I think it was like eight hours in the Louvre <laughs> and by the end of it we were just going stir crazy because there's so much to see. It's so big. We got lost at one point because it's such such a huge museum. It's that big, is it? Oh, it is massive. You cannot see it all in one day. <laughs> and we sure tried to see as much as we could. Wow, oh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like heaps of fun. Yeah, it well, was wonderful. That's awesome that you learned so much and, and had a great time while experiencing all this, this different stuff compared to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found talking to a lot of my international friends on this podcast that's that shock when you arrive to Fran to france that's sort of a lot of the shock that i myself felt but also a lot of my fellow classmates felt when we arrived in the u.s it's like 
well, hang on, we just got dropped here. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know who to talk to, like what's going on. So we just yeah. had to very much figure a lot of that out for ourselves. Yeah. Well, even when you just arrive in the airport, airports are all set up so differently. And it's like, wait, where am I going and what do I have to do right now? It's just, it was so crazy. And then trying to find the taxi, get our bags and baggage claim. We were like, where are we going? Different language. Um, yeah. No idea of like the geography of things, where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Love that experience. So just throwing yourself in the deep end and then working it out. I oh, think yeah. it's such a great, great tool for growth, I think. It is. So that's that's the France, uh, the French, sorry, the side of things. So what about the anthropology? That I came into my sophomore year of college because I had just dropped a communication major. I decided that I didn't want to do that. There were some classes I didn't want to take. Looking back on it, I should have just stuck it out and done that because it would have been a really good major to have, lots of good skills. Um, but I had just dropped that and I needed to fill a class credit uh, for one that I had just dropped because I was very confused the whole time, didn't know what was going on. It was uh, PR. Um, and the whole time the class was just not structured in a way that worked with my brain. And I was freaking out the whole time. I was like, I don't know what's happening in this class. Um, but I had just dropped that. So I needed to fill a class credit. There was nothing available that was of any like help to me in my majors or even in my main courses that you had to take your audit classes. Um, except there was one anthropology class that was a night class on Tuesday nights. And I asked some of my friends because I had a lot of friends that were anthro majors and it's a very small program. So I don't know how I found all the anthro majors to become friends with, but I managed to. And I said, is this a good class? Would you recommend it? Is the professor good? And they said, yeah, he's really great. Um, his classes are very chill. You basically get graded on one project and it's your final paper you write. And usually he opens the door for you to write kind of about whatever you want pertaining to the class. So I decided to bite the bullet and I just took that class, even though it was not going to mean anything towards any majors for me. I just needed to be a full-time student at that point for my financial aid. Yeah, just add up the credits. Yeah. Yeah. So I needed that to get my full amount of credits and I ended up loving it. It was the prehistory of the Northern Plains class. And in that we learned how to flint nap which is like hitting rocks together to make arrowheads. Oh, we had really? a hands-on class for two weeks of how to do that, which was super cool. And I was like, well, why would I not love this? I loved history in high school. I almost was a history major in college, but I was like, I don't want to just read a bunch of primary sources. Well, I found out anthropology and archaeology is hands-on history. So I really loved that. Um, so anthropology is the study of humans, isn't it? Yes. So there are four different like subfields of anthropology. There's cultural, linguistic, archaeology, and biological. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's a holistic study as you learn in any anthro class you take at Augustana. <laughs> you I have to learn all the basics. Yeah. Um, but... I'm mostly, Augustana mostly focuses on cultural and archaeology. Now they are getting more into the program where they have biological anthropology and forensics, um, but they don't have linguistics at all. But yeah, I mean, fell in love with archaeology and then throughout taking more classes because you have to take the, like the holistic study for the major at Augie. Um, I also ended up falling in love with the cultural aspect because you it is just all about learning about different cultures, where people come from, why they think the way they do, why they do things the way they do. It was really cool. And I fell in love with it because it's just it opens so many doors to so many different fields of study, different experiences, everything. Yeah, I have an interest with that. And I sort of discovered that through an art history course that mm -hmm. I took at Augie, yeah. which again was just uh, like I just had to I think it was art credit maybe that I got. Oh, oh no, it would have been a history one, I think. Um, just adding to the general electives. But I remember taking that class and I was quite shocked by how much, like how interesting it was and how engaged I was looking at um, like photos from 
because it was from the, the start of time up until like, I don't know, 5000 AD or something was mm-hmm. the sort of time frame we looked at. But looking at like the cave paintings and how that like developed and you can tell so much about the people and the culture of that time, but just by looking at the art, which I found like a really fascinating vehicle to get an insight to what the people were like during that time. Yeah, that is a class that I wish I would have taken. But I got scared because I had so many people tell me that it was a really difficult class and that the like the midterm and the final was really, really difficult. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to yeah, do that. I don't that. think I did particularly well in that class, <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed the, the content of it. So yeah. I think it was 100% worth it and would yeah. recommend it to anyone as well. I was just too much. I was so worried on grades in college, which looking back on it, I wish I wasn't, which it's good to keep up really good grades for your transcript and everything. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. You know, it is the experience you gain from the class and the cool things you learn about the world and anything in the subject that you really take from it. Well, I think I found that. I don't know. Did Have you actually used your degree to get a job since finishing Augustana? Technically, no, but when I was interviewing for every job that I could, it took me six months to find a professional job after graduating, but um, I would just, I sold the cultural side of my degree because I did a research project senior year looking at um, the tension between Russian citizens and American citizens, like Cold War tensions and how they've kind of ebbed and flowed ever since the end of World War II. So I really just sold the cultural aspect. Like I know how to work with people because I've been put in situations um, where I've had to work with 40 other students of completely different backgrounds, which was at field school for archaeology. We all had to get along, otherwise it was not going to be pleasant for any of us. So you use your people skills that you gain from the cultural side of anthropology um, to really live your life. Like you can pick up so much from that, just knowing different people are going to think different things and do different things. And how do you approach situations with others um, and not go into it with biased thought to be able to work with anyone and everyone you come across. So that's kind of how I That was your pitch sold it. with, yeah. the, with the, the degree that they saw on the piece of paper. That's sort of how you made that connection. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. I mean, because I have not directly used my degree mm-hmm. since graduating, but I think all the skills that I learned have like 100% like helped me to get to where I am. But like I, especially like video work, there's no resume or any of that stuff anymore. So it doesn't, I mean, I guess it does apply like, oh, well, I was head whatever at this company. But at the end of the day for video, if you can prove that you can make a good video of like whatever job you're sort of trying to apply for, well, that's the ultimate test. Mm-hmm. I think that's sort of – and, yeah, it's, it's not always about like the degree itself. And like you said, with like the, the grades that you got, well, I mean, at the end of the day, you still got the degree mm-hmm. and that's kind of what they see, not, not the, I don't know, 4.0 or whatever GPA you ended yeah. up with. Yeah, well, even going off that, I remember freshman year of college, I was so focused on my grades. I went in for an advising period with my French professor and he looked at me. I said – how, like, what percentage do I need on the final to get an A in your class? I need to know exactly what I need to get. And that'll put me at ease. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not telling you. He said, you can go off of what your test scores are and see about the average. And that'll give you an idea. He's like, I'm not telling you. And I was like, no, Dr. Fish, you need to tell me. I was like, I need to know because I need an A in your class. And he said, JC, C's get degrees. And I said, you are my advisor. You are not supposed to be telling me this right <laughs> Seems now. Seems like such lazy advice, but I think, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very valid. I think. It, yeah. It has stuck with me forever because now, like I said, looking back, I'm like, you know, I would have been okay if I would have gotten some more B's in classes instead of focusing on trying to get a 4.0 GPA in college. Very important to reflect back on that. I think because a lot of people that I have talked to on the podcast said that they would 100% sacrifice the studying that they did not do nearly as much and spend more time with like the people that they loved and the people, all the friends that they met at college. And I like, I would agree. I mean, probably didn't really do that much study looking back, (laughs) but I mean, 
I loved all all the the memories and the highlights for me were the the late nights that we did with people and like the parties we went to or just different activities that we did mm-hmm. and just hanging out with one another. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I would <laughs> I would go back and probably not try to focus so much on my grades and my parents might be a little bit upset if they hear that. But it's true because you can't get those experiences back and you can't get those people necessarily back for more than a little chunk of time. I mean, my best friends from college live in uh, Minnesota and in Wisconsin, which are both eight to 12 hour drives from here or a flight uh, and flights in the US are quite expensive. (laughs) So it's hard because I'm like, man, I wish I could go back and I could spend more time with them. Granted, a lot of my friends were in the same boat as me, so we would just study together. But it's like, man, it would have been so much nicer to take that time to just hang out instead of focusing on sitting together for eight hours while we all wrote papers, you know, would have been more fun to just focus on hanging out, having fun. If anyone needs more proof of that, I'm doing a whole trip back to the US just to catch up with my friends. I mean, there's other places in the world that I'd like to go to Mm -hmm. because I've been here before, but... I think the people like all my the friends that we that I left behind because I sort of I left at the end of COVID, so it was a very abrupt way to sort of leave college. But I mean, I'm so super excited to go and um, just catch up with people and have them on the podcast, so we can really just unpack the whole college experience because, mm-hmm. like, that's how passionate I am about it. So yeah. I think it's I think it's a very important message that it. it at the time, it seems like it's all about the grades, but and it's important to do as well as you can, but it's not, you can just take the pressure off. You don't necessarily mm-hmm. need to because whatever you want to do, like you can make it work one way or another. Yeah. And you're, you're a testament to that, I think, JC. <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'd most people will say it, but I'd give anything to go back and experience some of the things that I was able to do, be on the sidelines again, be with those friends again in the same place and do all the things that we love to do in college when now we're all grown and all over the world. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's unbelievable. But I'm certainly happy to be back. So it's, and it's, it's been great catching up with you so far mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, it's been great. Even it's been short, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. Like my plans, just, but yeah, my, Travels just all over the place, so yeah. Try my best to see as many people as I can. So, I'm, but I'm glad that I, I've made it here. Yeah, it's very good to see you again, especially after the very abrupt ending to college and having to go home for COVID. Well, because it was, I mean, particularly sad because um, you you actually dropped Max and I off at the airport that morning mm-hmm. that we left. And well, did you want to describe the uh, like the whole situation from your point of view? Yeah. So. I remember Max and I were talking a lot at that point. Um, We were planning to hang out because nobody was left on campus. Everyone had gone home basically. So you and Max were like the only two people that I was able to hang out with. Such a bizarre time. Like Mm -hmm. it was, it was very eerie because like there was this COVID thing happening, but we weren't really too sure what it was Mm -hmm. yet, but everyone had stayed at their homes or wherever they were for spring break. And there's only sort of a few international students and a few other locals who were sort of around the, the college at that time. Yeah. So I remember I would go back on campus just to hang out and study and do homework with Max for whatever classes we still had going on that we knew we had work to get done. Didn't know when we were going to go back to school and get back into the swing of things with classes. But we were still working on things. But he was planning to come over and spend a afternoon with my family we were going to play some card games together and just kind of hang out um whatever because it was something to do while everything else was closed and I remember I think it was that morning or the morning before he texted me it was just about 7 a.m and he's like I need to call you and I was like can it wait it's pretty early like why do you need to call me so early um but he ended up calling me and he said Zach and I have to go home we're leaving on a flight tomorrow morning and we have to go home because Australia is closing its borders. And I was devastated. It was really tough because it's like my last 
friends from college that were still in town that I knew I could still spend some time with because you guys didn't have family in the U.S. to stay with. You were just kind of hanging out with whoever was available and spending time with anyone that wasn't just you two, you know? I think that that time it was me, Max, Stig, and Bjorn. I think the four mm-hmm. of us were mainly hanging out together. Yeah. So there weren't many people left. Yeah, there weren't re- very many people. Um, so it was like that was my last little thing plucked away from me of my friends from college that I'm like, now we have nothing except sitting at home. So... I remember I didn't just want to have you guys leave and say goodbyes beforehand. I was like, I can't do that. I'm available. Your flight was super early, I remember. So I think I got up at four something to come get you and then picked up Max. I think we took separate cars. You, I can't remember who you went with. Sophia Um, and Eduardo came to the airport with me, I think, Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So we split up the cars and... Drove there, said our goodbyes, and you guys headed off into the airport. I just remember I turned around and I immediately started crying because it was the last thing taken away because of COVID. And I just, it was devastating having that happen because I didn't know when I would see you guys again. And now here it's been almost four years, going on four years, and we're just now seeing each other. And I haven't seen Max since he left, so... (laughs) Well, I think I'm get, I'm definitely starting to tear up to, describing that situation because it did just all happen so fast and there was like a lot to sort of take in that we just had to leave all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Um, after four, like four years for me at Augustana, but Max had been there for at least a year and a half by mm-hmm. that point and just having to say goodbye to all our wonderful friends that we had over that time just so quickly, it was, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, you didn't even get a definitive end to your senior year even because it was just all – there was nothing there left w- really. It was such a crappy way to finish because we mm-hmm. went home, did the last two months online and didn't really – like we didn't get a graduation ceremony. If you think there was – the president jumped on with a few of um, – a call with the international students and that was sort of like we did a bit of a, a farewell thing there but – I mean, it's just not the same as a like a U.S. graduation and sharing that moment with yeah. all your friends too after you've really accomplished something together. Yeah, that honestly, it made me feel really bad too just for all the international students that you spent your time, you spent your money going and taking this amazing trip abroad and spending four years completely away from your family minus maybe going home for summer breaks and you really had no end to it, which that's, it's just so sad. It is very sad indeed. And well, it would have been tough for you as well because everyone just disappeared on you mm-hmm. and then it's all empty. And then you, well, you still would have had to do all the stuff remotely as well to finish yeah. off the year. It was definitely strange, especially when they had us go move our stuff out of the dorms and there was the campus was a ghost town. There was nobody there. It was the strangest thing ever because you had to sign up for a time. I think they allowed only a few families at a time to be in each building um, to move your stuff out and then had to leave and say goodbye to campus for the year. And to go even deeper, it's extremely devastating because and every, like probably 99% of the people that have in this podcast, the international students say like, the common question is, why would you go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota? Because it's a very re- remote place. It doesn't have, you know, the, the nice weather like Florida does or the fancy campuses like you might find in California or some, mm-hmm. some somewhere else. But the thing that makes a college so great in Sioux Falls and at Augustana in particular is the people. Yeah. And so for the people to be extracted from this, like all the buildings in the college itself, it becomes completely lifeless. Yeah. Because the people are the lifeblood of what makes Augustana so great. Yeah. I mean, you can ask almost anyone on campus and about their experience and almost everyone will say classes are pretty good. Professors are great. Um, The rest of the amenities and buildings are kind of run down. You know, it's just it's a campus in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There's not much to it. But the people that you meet along the way are what make that journey and that experience so special. 
And then so starting back up again the following fall because you were you're two years younger than mm-hmm. Max and I. So you were, you were still a sophomore at that time. So coming into your junior year, what was that like? Because I'm pretty sure that was still right in the thick of things. So did it even start up properly? Uh, they tried to make it as normal as possible for the incoming freshmen because they didn't want them to feel like they got that experience taken away from them. But I was actually a Viking guide that year. It was very strange. They told us they were like, do not talk about your experience as a freshman because we don't want them to start comparing and feel bad about it. And then they were really trying to save those freshmen from dropping out because it was going to be such a different experience. Um, So it was a lot about trying to make everyone as comfortable as possible in their freshman year so they don't just all drop out. Because I know... um, Dropout rates were pretty high for freshmen that fall 2020 just because things weren't really back to normal. Some colleges didn't even go back on campus. Uh, We were fortunate enough at Augie that we were able to. We just had hybrid options for classes. I had two classes that were strictly outdoor classes, even in the dead of winter. Um, In the dead of winter? Yes. How does that even work? Um, Well... We were told to bring, if you wanted to bring a lawn chair, you could bring a lawn, a lawn chair and bring blankets, wear layers, and be smart. That was essentially what it was uh, because this particular professor, she was an anthro professor. Her daughter has severe asthma. So she's like, we are not risking anything. So we were outdoors. We were all spaced out for class and we were all in masks. So... It was, it was just crazy. I mean, it was a hybrid option as well. So she would pull up Zoom on her laptop or whatever and have it wired up to the Wi-Fi somehow outside and would stream the class as well for students that were sick or gone or whatever. And on some of the colder days or super rainy days, she would say, we're just going to be online. But otherwise, on nicer days, we would sit outside There was one day in particular where it was really snowy and we still had class outside. It was the weirdest thing. (laughs) I mean, even I remember like there were still days where it would be negative 40 degrees Mm -hmm. and that doesn't matter if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius because they literally (laughs) both cross over. That's how cold it is. Mm -hmm. But we would still go to class as if it was a regular day. There was never a snow day we had at Augustana, yeah. which I thought was ridiculous. And we even got an email sent, hey, you know, it's pretty cold outside. Classes are still on, but make sure you're not outside for more than five minutes or you will get frostbite. <laughs> yes, that is exactly what South Dakota winters are like. There's always at least a week in like either January or February, usually in January. So it would always be over J term too, which is why they would never cancel classes because you couldn't risk canceling a day because that's an entire week of a class. Mm. Um, You have those long three hour classes that you mm -hmm. learn probably a week's worth of content just in that one sitting. Yeah, so they could never cancel those classes, but it would be negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit out. And they're like, yeah, uh, you need to building hop if you're coming from the towers and you have to go all the way over to humanities. Like you, you have to go through buildings. Otherwise, you will get frostbite just walking to class. It was the craziest thing. <laughs> yeah, I can't, believe, I can't believe that, yeah, just the extremes that we went to. Mm-hmm. And so well, it eventually sort of balanced itself out and things became back to normal, I'm assuming. Yeah, um, we were definitely masked up for, I think it was, was it all of my junior year? Most likely. I think it was all of junior year and then senior year, fall, I think it was part of the way through fall, they decided, well, masks can be optional now. Um, right, so I'm guessing no one put one on then. Not many. There were there were a few and some of the professors still did, but for the most part, I think everyone was just really itching to get back to normal. I mean... That whole junior year, we missed out for dance team. We missed out on an entire football season and an entire normal basketball season. We d- we weren't on the sidelines at all. I completely missed out on a full year of dance team, which is what I have tried to avoid by not studying abroad for a whole semester or a year, um, but still missed out on it anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, that's and that's 
it's really sad because like that takes away from the experience and doing mm-hmm. the things that you love and what you came to college to do as well. Yeah, it made it really tough on a lot of us, I know, because so much was shut down. I mean, I think even to the point, I think they didn't do very many late night events either. So they kind of got rid of those Which for those, the year. Those and are like the most fun events ever. Yeah, they were a lot of fun, the ones that I went to. And they had a huge draw from students. So the fact that they only had, instead of, I think they did one, was it once a month, I think? or At least once a month, if not twice. Mm-hmm. They, I think they cut it down to one every couple of months just to avoid people being around each other, which made it really, really tough. Um, yeah. Well, after that emotional goodbye that we were just talking about before, well, it's making it seem a little bit better now, knowing that it was pretty crappy and hard to deal with sort of moving forward. Mm-hmm. That must have been extremely difficult. And so at Augie, you also were part of the orchestra as well? I was for three full years and then just a little bit into my senior year. We had a transition of a different um, orchestral director that the program did not flourish under. (laughs) Um, Were you on the the violin? I played the viola. The viola. Yeah. So a step lower than the violin. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, that was pretty fun. Um, I think my favorite part of that was my freshman year. We got to play an entire Disney concert. So our orchestral director bought like this whole huge production that Disney basically gave school or well, actually not schools. We were the first university to put it on. They usually only allowed professional orchestras to do these programs because they were very difficult pieces. Um, But our director really pitched our school to Disney and they were like, okay, we'll trust you. But they sent out um, vocalists to sing along to the music that we played. Really? It was such a cool production. And it was amazing because we were playing professional level music. And our orchestra was not like the greatest program by any means, but everyone was so driven and wanted to work so hard to make sure that that concert sounded good because everyone just you love a good Disney movie. Yeah, you know? I'm an absolute sucker for Disney and all the all the movies they make as well. Yeah, so everyone just got together. We went to all of our sectionals and we worked really hard and worked out the pieces that were, or the sections that were really tough. And we made a really good production and we had two nights of performances for that. And that was my favorite orchestra memory by far. Yeah. Huge oh, it, crowd. It sounds incredible. And the <laughs> fact to actually get the, like, the license or the rights to use all of that awesome mm. music as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it was great. I've never done anything like it. Probably will not do anything like it again. Um, but that was, I'm so glad that I was in the orchestra for that. <laughs> so you mentioned before that you were a Viking guide mm-hmm. and another leadership position you had was a VA, so a Viking advisor, which is basically like mm-hmm. a hall monitor. Mm-hmm. And you said you had some interesting experiences with that. <laughs> Yes. Um, So I was only a VA for my senior year, but one of the girls on the dance team also wrote for the Augie newspaper, The Mirror, and she asked me to write an article for it. And I was like, sure, I can do that. And she said it was for the experience, um, writing on the experience of being a VA and what it means and how your experience is this year compared to prior years. I had tried to find anyone and everyone to write this article because I was like, I haven't done this in the year past um, to even compare to what the difference in responsibilities are. But nobody wanted to bite. No one wanted to write that article. So they wanted it. And I said, okay, sure, I can do my research and I can write an article the best that I can. And we had some struggles. One of the residence halls was closed down for renovation. So we were down one residence hall um, and the freshman dorm, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Berg Soccer that was closed down. So I think Solberg and then Tuve both had less VAs um, to split up the responsibilities of on-call shifts uh, as compared to the towers being Stavig and Grand Scow. Um, so 
there was just some struggle there with VAs getting burnt out during their role because some people would have to pick up multiple shifts a week to fulfill their duties, whereas others would not even have to work once a week in order to get their on-calls fulfilled. So I wrote this article basically explaining the difference in hours and how it's a bit unfair and how we were told that there would be less responsibilities this year compared to last year. I even asked people uh, for their opinions on how their experience was in years past um, and then compared it to my own to try to get that aspect in there. Um, and I wrote about that, but then in the end I wrapped it up and said, you know, but it is such a rewarding experience to be able to have this role and foster connections and relationships with different people, especially for me, um, helping out on an all freshman floor, uh, of a bunch of freshman athletes for the most part, um, getting to make those relationships and make a fun experience on the floor instead of just here's my dorm. I'm going to sleep here and that's it, you know? So I made sure to mention that it was still a really good experience and I would recommend for people to do it if it's something that interests them, at least to do it once. But Augie admin was not very happy about it. (laughs) 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 Um, So they brought all the VAs into a meeting uh, to discuss the article and why as students it is our responsibility to go directly to the administration if we have any concerns with our roles on campus um, to avoid showing that there's any rift or any cracks in the foundation at Augie. Which makes Um, sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But see, I didn't think that I was doing anything like super wrong because I, I tried to make it a good article yeah, and I didn't e- expressing it how it is. Yeah, it was, I made it very factual. And then for the opinionated part, I made it into a good experience, you know? So I didn't think that there would be much problem other than stating the difference in hours between different, um, the, the different VAs. buildings. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't think it would be too bad, but the Dean of Students had a chat with all of us and (laughs) he ended up saying that it was disrespectful. He wouldn't even say who wrote the article, um, which we all knew it was me because my name, my face was on the article. (laughs) Um, I know a smiling (laughs) picture of me. Um, So we all knew what it was about and he said, it's disrespectful. You need to come directly to us instead of just writing an article, like have a one-on-one conversation with us about this. And when it came down to it and he asked for questions, I think he wasn't expecting anyone to speak up on it, but almost everyone in the room spoke up on it and how we were unhappy with how he handled the situation and how Augie Admin itself handled the situation and how having these different roles and still having the same stipend for the amount of work that different people were doing was not fair of them. And I even spoke up to him and said, you know, you're asking us to respect you and come directly to you if we have a problem, but now you are calling me out and trying to shut me up in a room full of my peers because you want me to be embarrassed and feel bad that I wrote this and not speak up about it. Even though everyone else agrees with you. Yeah. I don't think he thought everyone would agree with me. I think he thought that it would be sort of a shun, a shaming moment. He interpreted it as a bit more of an opinion piece as opposed to like, this is actually how it is. Yeah. And he even said this article was not factual. And I looked at him and I said, what about this is not factual? I checked it with so many people in all the different residence halls to make sure that what I was putting out there was correct. I didn't want to put out any false information because my intent was not to make the VA role sound like it was a bad role. Like that was 0% my intention. I was just writing what I got asked to about the difference in positions from year to year and within the residence halls themselves. Um, A lot of us spoke up to him (laughs) and expressed how we were unhappy with the way he handled the situation and how admin was handling the VA role itself. And they ended up sending out a poll asking us what we would want as a different stipend or 
whatever to sort of quiet it up and keep it all covered. And so what they ended of, up doing. A bit of bribery, a bit of money but, under the table. No, that's exactly what it was. It was the craziest thing. We were all so mad because what we were asking for, we were like, okay, other state schools, other schools in general give not only like free housing to these students that are the residence advisors, but they are also giving them a free meal plan and they make sure that they have the resources that they need to take on their role as best as they can. Whereas they were seeming to get mad at people, me, including um, other football players as well. I know struggled because we had busy schedules and we were all upfront about it when before taking on the role and said, will we be OK to do this? And they said, oh, yeah, you'll have less responsibilities this year than we have in years past. Um, and that just didn't end up being the case. So they definitely just decided they wanted to quiet it up. Um, come to find out now, a couple of years later, they completely gutted the entire like student living department. What's that called again? What do you mean, like the housing? Um, yeah. I don't know what But you they, mean. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of it now, but they ended up taking, like, everyone out of it. Like, all oh, really? of, all oh, of so the like hall the, directors. The, the staff, oh, all the staff yeah. that did the, that were there for the housing. Yep, all the hall directors, and even um, Jeff, what was his name? Oh, Jeff Benekamp. Yeah, he's gone, like, everyone... Got just taken out. Just change it completely then. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Because it was just not working and problems weren't getting solved that needed to get solved. I had a lot of problems on my floor um, and I just didn't have the support that I needed to get through that. So. Well, there you go. You're a change maker. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were the one that, that caused the, the whole restructure of the housing department. Yeah. Never the thought. The dorms at Augie. Never thought I would be, but I guess I made some change on campus. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's, well, it's an important perspective to bring up. And um, well, yeah, it just shows a good example of like we have systems in place, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always the most favorable way or the best way to do things. So I'm good on you for writing that article in the Augustana newspaper. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a scary time. Oh, we've got a camera monitor over there. She's ba doing her job. Bagel, your cat is jumping up on the back of the um, the tripod there. Yeah, is she... Do I need to go move her? No, she's fine. I'll take a little video of her. <laughs> she's trying to be the cameraman. <laughs> Which we were joking about before, like, hey, yeah. Bagel, get behind the cameras and help set up. Oh, that is the funniest thing. Jump up on it again. <laughs> She's such an adorable cat. <laughs> Camera operator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, now she'll actually get paid <laughs> for <laughs> yeah. her duties. Okay, now you're working. That's fair enough. <laughs> I can pay for that. Pay her in treats. <laughs> also, JC, you've had a very colorful experience at all you've done so many different things huge variety of stuff from dance the different classes you've taken with french which is also also took you over to france to study abroad the anthropology that you've done and then even like the va the viking guide stuff all of that you've done a huge array of things so with all of that done and said what would your letter grade be for your experience at augie I think I'd probably give it a B minus. I loved, like I said earlier, loved the people, loved the experiences, loved the professors a lot. Um, some of the classes were structured very weird and they were very intense too at times. Um, administration, we we know that I had problems with that, I We've guess. Been there. <laughs> but, talked about that. Yeah, but otherwise it wasn't bad. I think... Part of that is also because of the experience with COVID. That just was really, really tough trying to get through that, those two years of handling, okay, now we have COVID, now we're transitioning back into school and trying to get back to some normalcy. Um, so I think that comes into play a little bit, but overall it was still a great experience. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. B minus seems kind of low for what you've been describing, but I guess like even those factors like COVID and some of those other problems with ad <laughs> admission <laughs> department and all that stuff, but I guess those are enough to, to bring it down. So, I mean, I think that's fairly justifiable. Mm -hmm. 
And what about since Augustana? We talked about your pursuit with the Kansas City Chiefs, the uh, the football team, and doing the cheerleading for them. But what about um, like work wise? Because that's not a, a full time commitment. That's only yeah a few days a week. Mm-hmm. But what about the other work that you've been doing since? Yeah. So I am now working at a crop insurance office. So very different from what I studied. Crop insurance. So like, yeah. like corn and that, that sort of thing. Yes. Lots of corn, lots of soybeans. <laughs> uh, we handle some livestock as well. Um, but yeah, I'm so I'm the administrative assistant at this office. So I do a lot of the office events planning stuff. Um I handle like our events calendar and then just make sure that everyone has what they need in the office. And one of my main roles is being part of the culture team, which is kind of how, again, I sold myself with anthropology. anthropology. I know, right? It's all coming full circle. But (laughs) I definitely, I love that role because I get to work with other people in my office to plan these events and organize office outings and community service events for us to do as an office to also, I mean, we're all in different departments in our office. So it just find things to bring us together and spend time together instead of just staying in our different little cubicles on opposite sides of the office, you know? So that's been really a fun experience for me and my admin team. We're all located in different places. So I'm in Kansas, and then we have two in the Minneapolis area, one in Iowa, and one in Texas. We have all somehow become pretty close, despite I've only ever met my supervisor and one of my other coworkers, the one that lives in Iowa, because she lives fairly close to here. So it's just been it's been a good experience there as well. Yeah, it sounds like an epic job, and just being able to collaborate with mm-hmm. people, I find goes a huge like goes such a long way and I find the work that I do, I'm often by myself, which even I'm doing the work that I really love, that still feels a bit empty because of that by itself. So I think even just being surrounded by good people in a good job, like that's win-win. Yeah. Well, the people really, just like at Augie, the people make the experience in the office. I, I mean, did I ever think I'd be working in crop insurance? Absolutely not. Um, But the people honestly are, a lot of the reason that I'm staying there. I just really love my coworkers. They have all been super welcoming, super kind. We joke around all day together um, and we can kind of nicely pick on each other at times, you know. It's just, it's very a fun environment to be in. Beautiful. And then do you see yourself doing that for the foreseeable future? Um, I don't see myself sticking in crop insurance forever. But it is definitely something that I can stay in for now and just build my skill set and see where life takes me. I never really have a set like this is what I want to do for work. Um, My dreams and goals right now all focus around dance. So I'm just doing what I need to to get by um, financially. You need lots of time and attention put towards Mm -hmm. that and energy as well, I think is a big one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, that's good. You don't just sort of going to go with the wind and focus on the chiefs that's Mm -hmm. where we're going yep that is that's the main goal and dream (laughs) yeah terrific and then so jc if you wanted to give your younger self who's maybe coming out of high school some advice after the college experience and even the work that you've been doing now what sort of advice would you give your younger self um i would probably say research your colleges better Um, As much as I did enjoy my experience at Augie, and I would not trade the friends that I gained from that for anything. Um, I do know that they're like looking back on my experience compared to what I've heard and seen from other girls auditioning for the Chiefs, especially um, different college dance programs are completely different. I mean, different cultures, different things that they do performance wise competitive wise, anything, um, research those dance programs more instead of just for academic wise, just a French program, you know, um, do that and probably research more like a variety of majors more 
because like I said, I haven't been able to really use my anthropology major. And I loved the classes I took, love the people I met from it. I've gained a lot of good experiences from all of that, but it would be helpful to maybe have a communications major on top of it or even minor or journalism, which is another one that I kind of tossed around. And now business and marketing is such a huge thing that most places want. So maybe doing marketing or something, you know, researching what I maybe want to do a little bit better. Right. Which I find is sort of, it's a little bit interesting because like a lot of people tell us just pursue your passion. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you did that with the anthropology, but maybe you're saying, well, maybe that's not actually the best way to go about things. Yeah, that is unfortunately what I've found um, in the professional world. Nowadays, most places are really looking for business and marketing. And if you don't have that piece of paper that says you studied business and marketing, they might just automatically toss you out the door because they want that piece of paper. <laughs> you know, it's very strange. Um, and I think there is merit in studying your passion, um, but maybe also try taking some of those other classes and see if those might be an option, even though it just seems like, oh, I don't want to take a bunch of business classes. It's like you can learn a lot of really good skills for that, that you can then use in your skill toolbox, if you will, um, to pitch when you are trying to get jobs later. Yeah. Well, I, I sort of fell into business after trying to do exercise science and then mm -hmm. not wanting to pursue that anymore. And, and business was sort of a fallback. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So a business, because it's sort of general mm -hmm. and I find like it has served me really well. And I think, I mean, making money goes like ties directly to business and just those, those general businessy skills, I think do go a long way. Yeah. And I don't think you realize that if you're dead set on, well, like me just being like, I don't want to do that. That's so generic, you know, you gain a lot from it. I guarantee <laughs> So then what so the advice for someone would be to think about what they really want to do and maybe just have a broader scope of like what the future may hold mm -hmm. and then maybe take that into account a bit more than just just do what you like and go with that. Yeah, see what will help you out in the future. Also do what you enjoy and what you love, but make sure you have all of the skills and experience you need to go out into the real world. Yeah. And is there anything else, JC, that you wanted to share after we've been talking? Anything, any memories that have popped up, any fun experiences or anything that's any low moments, anything else that you can think of? Oh. Just an open-ended <laughs> question. So if you don't have anything, that's completely fine. Favorite memory of college, um, sophomore year winter formal. Uh, yeah. I went with Max and you helped uh, photograph Took a few us. photos yeah. in front of Ollie, the big statue, uh -huh. the big Viking. Oh, that is one of my favorite memories from college. I had such a fun night that night. Like I wanted to relive it again because, I mean, you and Max are just such great people and you lift everyone up and just try to get everyone engaged and having fun. So I just remember dancing and not feeling self-conscious, not worried about anything and just having a great time that night. And I mean, I can't speak for everyone there, but I know my group, we were all completely sober. So that was a different experience for me to be able to step out of my shell and just enjoy the moment um, completely sober with everyone. That was a great memory. And that's that's mm -hmm. something that sticks out to me. And there's I've got a few photos which I can pop up now and I'll, I'll show you later. But just the, the big group of, it's mainly international students, but we're all just, I don't know, just hanging out and having mm -hmm. a good time. It's just such a interesting group of people that, that came together. But I mean, that was, that was just such a fun night to dress up and mm -hmm. just dance and have a good time. Yeah. And it was also nice because uh, the proceeds from buying tickets for it went to charity, which was just another plus in there. But it was a very good night. I remember you getting down on the floor and doing the worm. Yeah. yeah, I was trying some crazy <laughs> stuff <laughs> out in the back there and I was, it was super good fun. Mm -hmm. And before we wrap up, I wanted to point out in your on your mirror, you've written in whiteboard marker, you've written, I can do this mm -hmm. on the mirror. And is there anything in particular that that is for? Um, I guess it's kind of become general. It started out as I would write little affirmations on my mirror, um, 
to keep me going because going through the process of professional dance auditions is tough and you can really get in your head. Last year, I got so in my head about it. I was so nervous all the time. I lost the fun of just dancing. So this year, I'm just trying to let that all go, have fun with the process, do what I enjoy doing, which is dancing, and have that little affirmation on there saying, you know what, I can do this. Or if I'm having a particularly hard day, even just at work, I can do this. It kind of applies to anything when I need it. And I think it's a good reminder that we can get through some pretty tough things. Absolutely. And I think having on the mirror is super powerful too. As you are sort of looking back mm -hmm. on yourself, you can see that right there. It's yeah. just a constant reminder to keep raising the bar and just keep putting in all the all the effort you can and, and things will work out. Yeah. I actually got that from a part-time job I had in Sioux Falls while I was working my senior year of college. Um, we would make a point to write on the mirrors different little affirmations for each other. And I took that and decided I wanted to bring that down here with me where I'm a little bit away from my friends, away from my family. And it's it's done wonders for the mental health, honestly. Because, yeah, you can look at yourself and say it to yourself or read it in your head and it helps a lot. Yeah, it's so powerful. I love it. That's great. Well, thanks, JC, for hosting me in your house. It's amazing. I still can't believe that I'm in the US <laughs> in Kansas City. Um, it's been so good to catch up with you. Um, we'll, we'll do a few more fun things this afternoon. Then I'm heading off to Minneapolis tomorrow morning, which is crazy. But um, thank you so much for coming back to college with me. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me.